Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Stephanie. This is In the Frequency of Hope. Tonight I have in the studio uh, Danny Gonzalez. Good evening, Danny. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. And tonight we are celebrating Pride. It's Pride Month, in case you hadn't heard, in case you hadn't seen any uh, rainbow flags. No, they're it, everywhere. No, it, it's June. That means it's Pride Month. Um, and so there have probably, you have probably seen or heard about some Pride celebrations going on in and around your area. Hmm. Where did I put? Oh, right there. Um, I hate it when I lose stuff by putting it on me. Um, so <laughs> uh, a nod to my mother. They weren't on my head this time. I put them on my shirt. Um, <laughs> my glasses um, anyway like I was saying if um, if you have been out of your house in the last month I'm sure that you have seen um, or heard something that would indicate that it's pride month um, and so tonight we intend to celebrate pride uh, with Danny in particular um, hoping we'll have a couple of other uh, folks call in and for everybody out there listening, please, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, the telephone number at WRWK is 804-464-1089. Uh, June the 1st marks the first day of Pride Month, which celebrates everyone in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. It also honors the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, which saw members of the community fight back against harassment from the police in Greenwich Village in June of 1969. The Stonewall Uprising was a tipping point for the gay liberation movement in the United States. The purpose of the commemorative month is to recognize the impact that LGBTQ individuals have had on history, locally, nationally, and internationally. All U.S. states once had laws criminalizing same-sex sexual behavior. One could be arrested and even imprisoned for propositioning someone for sex in public. Lesbians and gay men were regularly fired from their jobs if their boss or co-workers discovered their orientation. Two groups sprang up in the 50s that lobbied for acceptance of gay men and lesbians and their equality. The Mattachine Society formed in Los Angeles and provided legal assistance to gay men who were arrested for their sexual activities. And the Daughters of Thelitis formed in San Francisco and provided support and community to lesbians who often lost their children when they came out. The discourse of the time equated both male and female homosexuality with mental illness. The battle for LGBTQ rights has been an ongoing struggle to ensure equitable citizenship for all in the community. These included the decriminalization of same-sex sexual activity, making it illegal to discriminate against gay men and lesbians in the workplace and housing, allowing gay men and lesbians to legally adopt or foster care children, excuse me, provide foster care for children, stopping the unofficially sanctioned police or street harassment of gay people and allowing same-sex couples to marry. So those are just a few of the things that um, individuals and groups advocating for the community have been looking for over the years in the terms of creating um, equity. Mm -hmm. for LGBTQ citizens. Yes. Um, so, I don't know, we could talk about a bajillion different things. I think it would be so probably interesting to start off or probably best, um, best to help out our listeners um, who may or may not actually be familiar with kind of that whole history um, about what happened at... Well, I guess Stonewall, because Stonewall is really, that's today's the 50. I mean, we, maybe we should talk a little bit about the gay liberation movement that preceded Stonewall. Um, you know, as I already mentioned, the two, the two organizations from the West Coast, there were other organizations here working mm -hmm. on the East Coast as mm -hmm. well, I believe. Um, I think you mentioned, you may or may not have mentioned another group or two. Um, and then, of course, there have been certainly groups working since then um, toward... Um, toward uh, creating equity for LGBTQ citizens. Um, I think it's really interesting to go back and, and understand that how this started, because at the time they were considered really quite radical. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing <clears throat> were pickets 
Well, once a year on July the 4th <laughs> at once a year. Independence Hall in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's it. They were organizing what they would call an annual reminder. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, we're I, here. We're yeah. gay. <laughs> beep, beep, it's me. Remember <laughs> us? Um, which obviously um, the, uh, the tone of that changed. Now, a part of that was because the 60s, just became a time when the entire country was moving through upheaval in almost every system. Mm -hmm. um, some of that reactionary um, toward, I think, uh, having been oppressed earlier, and some of that really as a matter of um, understanding their own freedom as our scientific knowledge changed and, and we grew, you know, understanding the universe a little bit better. Um, and anytime I think that we understand the universe a little bit better, we begin to understand humanity a little bit better and mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 60s saw a time when, um, y you know, women who were working for feminism all of a sudden became radical um, in the 60s. And, um, you know, the civil rights movement went through a period in the 60s and 70s where it became less quote unquote civil um, and much more protest focused or um, demanding um, about, you know, finding their rights. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, um, the gay rights movement went through the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what we were seeing at the time, you know, even, even before the sixties, um, it was a regular occurrence uh, if there were a gay club someplace for the police to come in and raid it or cause trouble or wait for people outside so that when they left, they could be harassed or beaten or arrested, et cetera. Um, so. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. There were, so, yeah. so um, there were a lot of these, um, you know, and, and relatively people were forced you know, if they wanted the benefits of what one would have living in quote unquote society, then it would behoove them to live a closeted life. Mm -hmm. um, but that, of course, I think what we all understand now is that, you know, when you're living a lie, then you're probably going to make yourself sick in the process. Um, and so, you know, there was like a whole nother, a whole nother layer of harm for that community, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, um, I think as the as the sixties and seventies and some of the the um, fervor of our protests mm -hmm. seemed to die down, and people became a little more concerned with money mm -hmm. in the eighties. I mean, that's kind of how I remember it, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, the tactics for these various movements changed. And the other big thing that happened in the 80s that really changed, in particular when we talk about gay rights, was the, um, the discovery and advance, you know, advances, the discovery of HIV and AIDS, and then the medical advances that took place following its discovery, um, that really began to hone in on there's an absolute need to ascertain that this group of people really gets their needs taken care of mm -hmm. that have, you know, where they have been marginalized. Um, and then I think it was also probably in the eighties and forgive me because I, I, I know the story, but I do not, maybe it's Matthew Shepard is a young man who was drugged to death. Um, after, you know, people in his community understood his orientation. Is there a play? Are you referencing a play? I'm pretty sure that. Well, I mean, it's it's based on a true story. Yes, yes, so yes. That happened. I think that happened in the 80s as well. Yes, his I can't death. I believe, date, his, yes. I believe his death happened in the 80s as well. Um, and I think that th there were, you know, a couple of these big events that, you know, um, which the size of mm -hmm. AIDS or HIV as an event was because it was obviously worldwide and epidemic for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but then these other big news stories, you know, and it, you know, I think when, when we were, when we were faced with stories where we could clearly identify that someone had been tortured and murdered, um, and 
many families throughout the country could say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we have an uncle so-and-so, mm-hmm. you know, we have a somebody that we love and that we know and love. And that was really where I think the national consciousness began to make a change in regards toward being more accepting of people who are not heteronormative. Yeah, it was AIDS crisis was something you couldn't hide, really. It was like because people you knew would just suddenly drop off. We lost an entire generation of people in the queer community to the AIDS crisis, and that affects everyone in ways you couldn't even consider because like Mm -hmm. beforehand, you know, living in secret, living in the closet, it was like an option. And if people were out of sight, they were out of mind. But once that AIDS crisis hits and suddenly people Mm -hmm. are just dying in masses, it's not something that can be ignored anymore. And it's also highly sympathetic. Like you said, people begin to lose family members that they might not have known were queer. And suddenly they're faced with this idea that like, well, this isn't a bad person's disease because uncle so-and-so isn't a bad person. Mm -hmm. So it like radically changes the way queer people are viewed in America. Which couldn't have come at a better time. When I think about the, the, uh, the other conserve, more conservative ideas that were gaining mainstream uh, normalcy, you know, when I think about, the 80s weren't my favorite times, folks. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> when I think about some of that stuff. Um, so it's, it, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a shining moment for hope um, that even in the midst of the rest of that, that, that this, this one story um, was changing, you know, that, that paradigm was changing at least for this one part of the population. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the better way to say that. Um, so I know that um, you had also told me, uh, besides Stonewall, you were also talking about, well, I guess we should fill people in a little bit more about Stonewall rather yes. than just referring to Stonewall. Yes. So, uh, for those of you who have just joined, this is WRWK 93.9 FM. We are in Midlothian serving Chesterfield, Henrico, Richmond, Hanover, um, and Goochland. We're using community radio to build a bridge from city to county, from left to right, and from neighbor to neighbor. We thrive on your engagement and your support. So come on out here, volunteer, and do something, or hit that donate button and give us some money. Um, (laughs) We like all of those options. Uh, Tonight we're celebrating Pride, and my guest's name is Danny Gonzalez. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Stonewall itself. Okay, so go ahead. Yes, okay. So the Stonewall Riots, we're at the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. They happened June 28th, 1969. Uh, Stonewall Inn was a gay club located in Greenwich Village in New York City. Um, I think it's important before we begin to define the word intersectionality. Uh, So intersectionality means that you can have multiple identities that intersect in ways that can radically change the way you're living. So living as a cisgender white man may that is gay is like a drastically different experience than being a black transgender woman and so okay so it's important to recognize that the stonewall inn which is recognized as like a major turning point for the queer liberation movement is largely the stonewall so stonewall was largely frequented by drag queens and by people of color because even Back in the 1960s, these people weren't accepted a lot into their own communities. There's always infighting in sort of like every community. And so even though we should all be united by our queerness, there's still a lot of like infighting over race and such. So Stonewall was a place that where a lot of people of color and drag queens um, and people that back in those days might have felt comfortable using the words transvestite, which like I certainly don't now. That is like uh, it's considered a slur now, but like those people have identities that we could consider transgender in like the terms we have today. So I'll be referring to them as such. And so the Stonewall Inn was particularly popular among trans folk and queer trans people of color, which you can call QT Pock for sure. You take the first letter of each word, QT Pock. That's, that's almost cute. Yeah, it's very cute. Um, and so, okay, yeah. Um, and so, 
Stonewall Inn was the place where like a lot of these people congregated and police had been harassing Cutie Pock in their own spaces for a while. It's like sort of a crime. Well, it is a crime that we can't really exist in the streets. And then we also can't exist in these club spaces, which have always been significant. Right. Um, I'm going to, we're going to come back to talking about Stonewall in just a moment because I do have Mike hanging on the line. He said that he would like to contribute to the conversation tonight. Hello, Mike. Thanks for calling in tonight. I'm well. How are you? I'm all right. I'm just trying to figure out why you fucking faggots are on the Whoa. I, okay. Whoa. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did not move fast enough. I apologize. Okay. Um, I'll have to be doing a much better job of screening calls for the rest of the evening, apparently. Uh, Mike, you are not welcome to call back. Um, have a nice day, but do it somewhere else, buddy. Um, <laughs> yep. Wow. It's 2019, everyone. Yes, Isn't everything great? I'm so, I'm so, so sorry. I, I, wow. Yeah. I need to not have anything in the way so that I can get to the phone. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people like to think since marriage equality has passed that we no longer need no. to do anything for uh, the queer rights movement. But obviously, that is not the case. Wow. Wow. I was, I'm so sorry. I'm going to, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to stop reacting to that in just a second. Yeah. I'm very sorry that I um, didn't move faster to shut Mike up. Um, I have, well, I don't know how to make that work better either. Nope. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. That's also not awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. That threw me. Okay. We can go back to talking about Stonewall. <laughs> yes, Stonewall. <laughs> Let's okay. do that. So, Cutie Pock weren't really allowed to express their gender identity or their love for each other on the streets. And so a lot of times, expressing yourself became something that you did at nightclubs, even though at these nightclubs, still a lot of laws that you're not allowed to, like, have, like, romantic contact with people of the same gender. But Stonewall sort of got away with this and ran their business because they were in cahoots with the mafia who were in cahoots with the police. And so a lot of times police would notify Stonewall of when a raid was going to happen, mm -hmm. but that didn't happen uh, June 28th. Uh, so police, sometimes when they do these raids, there's almost like a, a law that is not like in place, but it's an understood rule that the police would check for this three article of clothing rule. They would look at someone, determine their uh, born sex identity. So if you were born as a man, you had to have three articles of clothing that would have belonged to men. Um, sometimes this was checked through violent sex checks, a.k.a. Uh, hi, I'm going to violently examine your body and your genitalia. These are the sort of things that people would live with. And so suddenly it's June 28th. It's hot and everyone's a little drunk. And the police come in and queer people decide that they're just not going to deal with it anymore. And so I think it, there's like mixed reports as to what exactly spurred the the initial fighting. Some people say that someone was uh, like hit in the head as they were being put in the police car and other reports like that. But it just sort of started like a all out brawl. At one point, uh, the police were inside of Stonewall, which because they were in cahoots with the mafia, they also didn't have to stay up to fire codes. There was no fire escape. The police were in the building and someone uh, set the building on fire. Oh. And it was like originally, like it was eventually put out, but like this is the sort of fighting that happened. Uh, uh, 13 people were arrested, including employees and people violating the state's gender appropriate clothing stature. And I'm pretty sure it lasted for like five days or three nights, three nights. Three mm -hmm. nights. Uh, and because it lasted three nights, it was super visible. There had been riots before Stonewall that don't gain as much traction but because right. this one lasted so long. Uh, it sort of birth what we recognize now is the queer rights movement. Uh, numerous queer organizations were started, including the Gay Liberation Front, Human Rights Campaign, GLAAD, and uh, PFLAG. Lambda Legal. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> There's another one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. So you can see like this point in our history that night spaces and queer places are sort of the 
birthplace of community and queer rights, which then also becomes prominent in another New York location, like all ballroom culture, which emerged in the 1920s and exists now, but pretty much like we recognize the 60s and the 70s as the expansion of ballroom culture, which I can go into, or we can take some other questions. So, like I said, ballroom culture and nightclubs are popular because it's like somewhere where queer people can create their own space and it's not in the streets. Uh, so, people were... So in New York, there was a large population of homeless queer youth, which also, again, with that intersexual, intersectional identity, you find like a lot of Black and Latinx queer youth that suffer from homelessness. And if you've seen the movie Paris is Burning from uh, 1990, you would see uh, scenes from the queer nightlife where... Uh, people would perform in drag and people would compete in dances. And this was like sort of like a low, like an like underground subculture for queer people to unite and express themselves freely. And also it birthed this culture of what you would call houses. So a lot of like the queer homeless youth were looking for familial structure in their life, like because a lot of people, so many queer people are turned away from their family and suddenly they have nowhere to go and you don't know, like, what does adult living look like as a queer person? So these houses sort of started to pop up. They're almost like teams and they have things like mothers, which is why if you're, like, familiar with RuPaul and Drag Race, it's like you might hear, like, Mama Ru or even Lady Gaga is, like, goes by, like, mother to like to her, some of her fans and all that sort of originates with this ballroom culture where these young queer people were looking for structure in their life, looking for some place to be at night, looking for a way of expressing themselves and looking for meaning to the word family and community. Uh, that's still going on today. Mm -hmm. It's like a real tragedy that like, one second, I have a statistic on me about queer youth. Uh, so the Human Rights Campaign estimates that LGBT youth comprise up to 40% of the total unaccompanied homeless youth population, even though they only make up 5 to 10% of the overall youth population. Give me that again, please. So of homeless youth, up to 40% is taken by queer youth, even though queer youth only make up about 5 to 10% of the overall youth population. And if you're interested about learning more about that or helping out in the Richmond community, Side by Side is a local organization uh, that dedicates itself to creating supportive communities in Virginia's LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, part of what they do is they help assign queer youth affected by home instability to temporary, almost like foster homes or host homes. If you're interested in becoming a host home, I suggest you check out Side by Side's website or volunteer your time, volunteer clothing. Side by Side has a closet that uh, queer youth can come by and pick up clothing. There's a lot of things that affect queer living day to day that isn't something that necessarily people that are straight or live as the gender they were assigned at birth have to worry about. And one of those things is clothing. It's very difficult when you find out your queer identity and all your wardrobe doesn't match with the way you'd like to present yourself. It can be very expensive to replace your wardrobe. So if you have clothing that you would like to donate, you can check out uh, how to donate your time or your clothing or much of anything else to Side by Side to help a queer youth in your neighborhood. So I can go back and I can pull back some of like the importance of queer nightlife club culture. I can pull it into the present day by talking about Pulse Nightclub or if you'd like to take some questions or if you'd like to ask me some questions, we can scooch on to I that. I would, but you know what? I'm looking for the notebook where I was, we were talking earlier, I wrote some stuff down and then I walked away from it. Sorry about that. <clears throat> 
Okay, I apologize. I had to step away for just a moment to take another call. Um, so I'm going to answer the phone again. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm on double duty here. Uh, hang on one second, please. You can, but that's because I know you. Hang on. All right, we do have another caller. All right. Go ahead, Ian. Thanks for calling in tonight. What would you like to share? Hey, I love the, I love that you're celebrating uh, Pride Month. I think that's awesome. Um, that it makes you so proud of the station. I love listening to y'all. And uh, Danny is so well spoken. Is she a professional radio? My first question is she a professional radio talent? It sounds like uh, she's got a lot of. Uh, experience on the air. I mean, she sounds like a professional uh, uh, talk show person. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's so kind. Um, hi, my name is Danny Gonzalez again for like new listeners. Also, I use they, them pronouns for any incoming listeners. Um, I think the being well-spoken, I can attribute to being a drama club kid in high school. And then also I'm an education major. So if I show any weakness in front of the kids, they will attack. So I must speak <laughs> eloquently at all times. Is that why teachers do that? <laughs> yes. I can tell you, when we had a weak teacher, they were like, they were like blood in the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard that last call, that other caller, Joanne, I just had to say, man, there are so many stupid people and ignorant people in this world, and I feel bad that you had to listen to that uh, ignorance. There's a lot more people in the world uh, who uh, support you and love you guys and uh, like what you're doing. Uh, then, then, so I just don't want you to be discouraged by 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 the uh, the outliers. Uh, you know, they're just uh, you know, they're not happy with themselves. Not happy with uh, you know, they're not happy with themselves. So they lash at other people, and uh, it's disgusting and it's sad. Uh, but I think that you know, um, it's changing. Uh, it's not like 20, 30 years ago. I'm old enough to remember when. That was almost normal, and I feel like it's so not normal now. I feel like uh, in my short lifetime, which is, you know, uh, it just seems like it's dramatically changed, like the 70s and 80s, the, the attitudes are, are uh, and I know there's statistics that back this up, too, that um, things, uh, and it's not a partisan issue either, because uh, there's people who have, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I, think, I think that that is one thing that's actually completely, in this day and age, I really feel like um, it's a bipartisan thing because everyone in all walks of life and all families and all political stripes, they know people um, who, who are uh, gay. And, and I think it's in a lot of people's families. It's, 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 and I think that uh, I just think that this is a new time and it's an exciting time, uh, really. Uh, it's just so much different than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's, it's night and day. And I just feel bad that they have to remind that there's people like that that call into the radio, uh, that there's still people like that. Um, but I think that they're a minority, and I just want you to support. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ian. That was very kind. We appreciate hearing from you. All right. Thanks. Good night. That was swell. Oops, a daisy, and I didn't... I didn't, I didn't actually turn that off correctly. Uh, <laughs> with all the high-tech gear I've got to work with in here. <laughs> Technology changes so fast. Um, well, you're hanging up the phone, turning off the, yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, now, I really do appreciate that, um, getting a call of support, uh, particularly after receiving uh, such an unpleasant call in the first place. So, um, so thank you very much, Ian. Um, I'm going to let you kind of go back because you were in the midst of talking about something when we got that last call. Um, but then I was actually going to pick up with some of the, um, some, I'm going to read some of those things and then pick up on some of the statistics about some of the other things that we spoke about when we were, so I'll let you, I'll let you pick up with what you were saying. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Hello, yes, I was just going to pick up on what we talked about before of Stonewall and ballroom culture that a lot of queer people were finding themselves in nightlife culture and in drag. And 
these, a lot of these instances, even though ballroom culture exists, were very disconnected from me in both time and location. Um, I am 21 years old. I am from Winchester, Virginia, which is a fairly rural area. And so like a lot of these things felt very disconnected from me. I hadn't gone to Pride until I was like in my 20s. Um, but a week after I graduated, uh, June 12th, 2016, was the Pulse nightclub shooting. Uh, Pulse was a club in, or is a club in Florida. And on June 20, on June 12th, um, uh, it was extremely unfortunate that there was a shooting. There was an attack on Pulse nightclub, which is a queer nightclub. It was Latinx night. It was like a direct hate crime against queer people and people of color. And it was like the first time I'd really sort of lived through like a major hate crime after I'd found my career identity. And it really shaped a large part of who I am uh, because I don't know how many people remember after graduating high school, but you have this sense of invincibility and that like you can do anything. And I should have had like an entire summer before I left for college. I was leaving for VCU in Richmond, which I in my mind had seen as like this liberal haven where I could be myself, but then we're, you know, it's a week after where I'm so hopeful. And then I suddenly realized that even though queer people, we build these spaces for ourselves and we, you know, it's like we build nightlife. Nightlife is so popular because it's so far away from like the public eye where we're so shamed. And for me to realize that I was an 18 year old and even though I was going to a more liberal area and that I could be in a safer space that really there was no safe space for me at the time if Pulse nightclub, which was a queer space could be the victim of a hate crime, then really like where, where in the world was there for me to exist. So I only got a week to sort of live on that, that young invincible glow before I had to face reality. And also when you're in high school, like I was a senior in high school, one of the things about being, oh, we can take a caller, caller and then we'll go back to my okay, sure, high school we'll experiences so, if we'd like. Right now we're going to have Kevin coming up. Good evening, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. Hey, I'm here. How are you? I am well. Thank you for calling. I, I wanted to talk about what your queer rights movement is doing to the, the, the criminalization of masculinity of our, our youth. Or are you, for young people, where they're just made out to, you know, if I'm a straight white male and I encounter the likes of you, I have to watch what I say, step on my toes. She says I'm supposed to call you they or he. If you have a penis, you're a male. If you have a big china, you are a woman. It's just that simple. Well, I get well. I get how you see that it's simple from your perspective, and I'm I appreciate the fact that you called in tonight and that you're willing to ask some questions and hopefully listen to find out somebody else's perspective. So I'm going to let Danny field that um, since she uh, since since they identify they identify as they and them. Yes. Well, yeah. If he has a penis, I'm going to refer to him as a male. If he looks like he has a dick or a penis, I'm going to refer. Hey, 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 we already talked about language, Kevin. Yes, ma'am. FCC rules. If George, if George Carlin can't say it, you can't say it. I'm tired of and I have a 13-year-old son, okay? Okay. The people that, the, 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 the circumstances that, that I raised him to be, I raised him to be a man, a male, a strong figure who makes a good, you know, is physically strong, proud of what he does, work with his hands, go to law school like his father has something for himself. Why does everything that, that we as strong Christian men, why does what, everything that we do criminalized in your eyes? Why, why, why is it, a, why is it a, a, a crime of violence to not call you he if you have a penis? Uh, okay, so I see that you're not ready to move past the physicality. So I don't know that I don't know. I don't really, I don't know. Do you even want to continue with this? I think it might be handy if we take a step back. Maybe I was okay. like, didn't cover some building blocks. I think it might be useful to cover what the difference between sex and gender is because it seems like you're referring yeah. to 
the let's, physicality that you're speaking of, of someone having a penis and someone having a vagina. Let's do that. Let's start with the difference between sex and gender. Yes. Okay. So sex refers to what you're assigned at birth, typically in accordance to your genitalia. So someone being born with a penis means that you are male and that is your sex identity, but your gender is far more than just your sex identity. It's how you present yourself to the world. So even though I am someone that has a vagina, I can wear masculine clothing and I can have short hair. And a lot of times I'm actually mistaken as he in public, which I don't terribly mind. But so there's, there's a gender expression that's going on that doesn't always match sex, but like sex is still something that's important in the medical field. But what I disclose with a doctor and what is medically important because of my physicality isn't always in court, isn't in accordance with the way I would like to be treated in society. So I prefer to go by they, them pronouns because I don't particularly feel comfortable being regarded as a woman or a man. I think there's a lot of stereotypes surrounding what living as either of those identities means. And I'm not particularly comfortable living my life as either one of those slim two options. I think gender expression is a wide variety. Like, what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? You are why I am pro-abortion. You exactly are why I am pro-abortion. moved the microphone away and I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the call because I'm not comfortable with having you phone in and abuse my guest. So good night. Sorry about that folks. I, um, I, I want to maybe lay out some rules for any other callers that decide that they want to participate in tonight's conversation. We are willing to hear a variety of views. Um, there are a couple of rules that we follow here though. First and foremost, if you've ever seen the Carlin routine, the FCC has rules. You break those rules, I have a fine, and that is never okay. So don't break those rules. That goes for Mike and Kevin and anybody else that's got a mouth and four-letter words. Don't do it. Don't do it here. And secondly, do not ever call my program and abuse my guest. It will not be tolerated. Yes, you may go ahead. Okay, so I'll respond to a couple of those points. One being that being a man, a white, and Christian does not exclude you from a queer experience. So I'd like to say that like queer people are not in direct opposition to that. A lot of people think because like a lot of times there is like, uh, I have a lot of friends of like the Christian faith. And while I don't particularly like identify with that, a lot of my like Christian friends would vehemently say that they are welcome and that like God is loving to everyone and mm -hmm. that being Christian and being queer are not mutually exclusive. There are plenty of people that have found peace and love being both those things. And so I don't necessarily like someone saying that those two are mutually exclusive and that they can't exist together or that they're mm -hmm. oppositional ends. They're only oppositional if you want them to be oppositional. I don't think there's anything that means that they have to be. Um, and then also I'd like to say that whether you like it or not, queer people are going to be a part of your life. He said he has a 13 year old son. Well, I am soon to graduate as an education major and I will be a licensed teacher in Virginia and I want to teach middle schoolers. So like it, you like it or not, your children will be taught by queer teachers. They will have queer doctors. They will listen to queer radios. So much of what you enjoy is invented and curated by queer people. There's plenty of queer figures in history that we just don't talk about like in our schools. We will be talking about it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like so many like you 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 can't avoid queer people no matter how you tried. We've like mm -hmm. we've survived and we've thrived and we've been hidden figures in your history and I bet there's way more of us than you recognize in our history because one of the tricky things about being queer and trying to trace your history is that there wasn't a lot of the language isn't always the same. It's very tricky to go back and try to look at historical figures like past presidents and things and say, oh, they were gay or they were bisexual because those weren't terms used in those times. But like when we look at history, we can see things that are queer experiences. When you like see that maybe, ooh, someone had a very, like very close relationship with so-and-so who was like the same gender or 
someone was reclusive and had short hair in the woods. It's like, well, we might be able to identify that as a queer experience, but we can't stick a label on it. Right. Um, so it's like very difficult to trace back like all our, our queer ancestors, if you would like to call them that, but we can find. Right. And to your point, really, there's nothing new or different about gay people existing. Um, I don't, uh, all of the statistical information that I have ever looked at shows a relatively steady number of people across mm -hmm. the length of time that humanity has been hanging around. Um, what is new is that we have these terms. Mm -hmm. We have gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. And these are very recent additions to the common vocabulary. Because we didn't have those words 200 years ago certainly does not mean that people weren't having those types of relationships, though. Mm -hmm. So I have a fun list of some folks in American history that people may or may not be aware of. There was Albert Kashir, um, was assigned female at birth, but lived as a man, was also a Civil War hero. Mm -hmm. Do you have someone that you want to mention? Oh. Did you, I didn't know if you, did, if you had specifics, or should I go through my... Uh, a list of folks over here? Or? Oh, gee, Willikers. Uh, I don't have, a, you put me on the spot, and now I'm like <laughs> okay. trying to pull out like queer <laughs> historical icons off the top of my head. Um, uh, let's, uh, oh, we talked about Stonewall. So shout out uh, to transgender activist Marsha P. Johnson. Um, we have so much to thank for for black trans women in our community. We don't nearly lift them up as much as they should. And I think, uh, you know, we should do a better job at, job at that. So Marsha P. Johnson, you know, cool. experiencing Stonewall and then continuing to fight for transgender activism is someone that is certainly become like a icon in the queer community, but may or may not be shared um, with the heterosexual public as much. And like, I'm fairly certain not taught about in schools, which uh -huh. is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane Adams, you might recognize that name because uh, her association with social work in, the, in America. She lived with a longtime female lover. Charlotte Cushman, perhaps the most famous Shakespearean actress of the 19th century in U.S. and the Europe, lived openly with a series of women lovers. Bayard Rustin, who organized Martin Luther King's 1963 March on Washington, was an openly gay man. And when you, you started mentioning, I guess, artists and authors, my first thought was Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. And then, well, that, gosh, if we get into artists, that's just going to go even bigger, even yes. bigger and more. Langston Hughes, Walt Whitman. Um, go ahead. The, okay, one of the wildest things uh, to me was, okay, so the Queen movie recently came uh -huh. out, like talking about, like mostly about, Freddie Mercury is yes. like a very queer man's autobiography. Wild to me that like so many people are fans of Queen and are like vehemently homophobic. Like people were very angry at the movie. Like uh -huh. why did they got to focus so much on like how queer Freddie Mercury is? It's like, well, where is this disconnect for you? I remember growing up with some of those kids and being like, did you not see the name of the band? Yeah. Like, what didn't give it away? <laughs> like, what about like the song? Like, you can't disconnect the songs from like the queer experience and the experience of being a person of color. So like that just goes to show you again, like queer people are there whether you like it or not. And next time you sing Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, thank a queer man. You can't avoid mm -hmm. queer people influencing your life. Same goes for David Bowie, Elton John, um, and like all the likes. Mm -hmm. You can't avoid them. It's so wild that so many of our like 80s pop figures that are beloved by heterosexual men and heterosexual women that are very homophobic are very queer. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Who else did I come up with in my list? Oh, here's some fun stuff. Um, for you um, American history buffs, uh, there are a series of deeply emotionate, emotional and passionate letters between George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette. 
There are similar letters between Abraham Lincoln and his friend, Joshua Speed. Lest any of you forget, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt had a lover during her time as the First Lady. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Got some others. Oh, uh, gosh. Pick I have a like, favorite. I have like plenty, plenty of queer art historical figures. Mm -hmm. um, gosh. Let's, okay, let's start with uh, Frida Kahlo just because she's like recently become like somewhat of like a gift shop frequent um, image. Like a lot of people like to write her like off as this like feminist figure because she was a strong woman. But then sometimes people sort of begin to like ignore like the queerness of like her experiences. Like, yes, she had a husband. But she also had female lovers. And so she has like this queer experience that sometimes mm -hmm. gets brushed under the rug and isn't like always accounted for in her like feminist legacy mm -hmm. and then also we can move into like more contemporary artists and how they like work our ways into history so uh Candy Wiley who had a like a couple of years ago oh. had a show at the VMFA who's uh -huh. also recently done Obama's portrait yeah so presidential portrait will be in the history books forever yes. is in the national portrait gallery yes. is a queer black man yes, so like two identities that are like <laughs> very frowned upon in the yeah. United States but wrote yourself into history and now his artwork is something that will forever be a part mm -hmm. of our legacy and can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. I have some that are going to be super familiar because here in America our pop culture is full of TV and movie stars and stuff like that so we're just going to go through a list of some of those folks just for oh, fun. Yes. Ellen DeGeneres. Obviously. And one of our favorite things about Ellen DeGeneres is that she came out on national TV. Mm -hmm. um, Jodie Foster. We love Jodie Foster, mostly just because she's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and smart. Smart as a whip. Uh, Zachary Quinto. Quinto. Yes. Is it Quinto? Am I Quinto? Zachary Quinto. Quinto. Yeah, from, you might recognize him from Star Trek or American Horror Story. Right. So big pop cultural references. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Neil Patrick Harris. Mm -hmm. Doogie Hauser or How I Met Your Mother. Um, Robin Roberts from Good Morning America. Mm-hmm. Jane Lynch from Glee. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Glee earlier that that was, that was a big deal for you oh, when you were a kid. Yes. Uh, Glee came out when I was like in middle school. And so um, I was, we were talking earlier about like at what age I'd realized I was queer. And I was thinking about how I'd had a lot of queer experience as a young child, but I hadn't realized it until I could put a word to it. And that's because no one gives you these words as a child. And so like as a middle school teen watching Glee and then like, slowly finding like identities online I like I found words to my experiences so even though Glee looking back has some cringe moments I have a lot to thank Glee for also I was gonna put in celebrity Angelina Jolie is like open about being bisexual and mm -hmm. like which she is sort of like this American pinup male fantasy and mm -hmm. so you know it's very interesting that she also you know digs ladies mm -hmm. and that is something that you shouldn't ignore when you like talk about her there you go uh jim parsons from the big bang theory mm -hmm. he's the one that plays sheldon um raven simone which she was yes that's so raven that's so which raven. was my like whole childhood uh-huh uh-huh um guillermo diaz mm -hmm. from scandal mm -hmm. um uh maria bello I don't think I knew that about her until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, not that I, not that I follow lots of Hollywood gossip because, because mm -hmm. I have a real life. Um, Sarah Paulson. Uh, yes. Another American Holland horror Taylor. story. Um, and Holland Taylor is her, is her partner. Mm -hmm. um, Matt Bomer from American Horror Story. Cynthia Nixon from Sex in the City. Um, Kristen Stewart from Twilight. Mm -hmm. Holland Taylor, I already mentioned. Um, Adam Lambert. Who also opens for Queen now, which, like, if you'd told me is, like, a young little gay oh. watching American Horror Story and then him, like, also following, like, Freddie Mercury's, like, queer footsteps and he's, like, the lead singer of Queen now. It's, That's like, amazing. I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that that music speaks out to him yeah. in a lot of ways for him to like be able to follow in that footsteps with like the emotional similarities that queer men experience. 
That makes sense. Um, Elton John, you already mentioned. Um, Sarah Gilbert, you guys might remember her from Roseanne or The Talk. Um, Cheyenne Jackson, also from American Horror Story. Mm -hmm. Ryan Murphy loves is having the entire queer cast. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, well, kidding. okay. So Ryan Murphy oh, is a queer man. He's also the creator of Glee, so it makes sense to also yeah. bring up American Horror Story. And also earlier, I was talking about ballroom culture, and oh. I was talking about like the New York scene with like the subculture of dancing, drag, voguing. Um, there's a show also created by Ryan Murphy called Pose. Recently, the second season just came out. If you're interested in seeing depictions of queer life made by queer people, and if you're interested in seeing mostly people of color, mostly black people, actual trans people, playing trans people, I suggest watching Pose. Uh, Ryan Murphy makes a lot of queer content, which is why a lot of like queer actors are popping up on this list because Very cool. queer creators hire queer actors and... As they should. Yes. As they should. Uh, Colton Haynes, not one that I'm familiar with. Ooh, Dreamboat from uh, Teen Wolf. There you go. Ellen Page. Oh, yes. Of, of yes. Um... Ben Wishaw. Mm -hmm. Ben Wishaw. I need to go to the movies every once in a while because some of these folks, I'm like. Yeah, Ooh, no Ben idea. Wishaw is in but I also Cloud think. Atlas. He's yeah. in James Bond. Okay. He also, I think he voices um, Paddington Bear. Really? Yeah, so ch children's movies, you can't keep I'd children. Have to, I'd have to go see that one. Um, yeah. Wanda Sykes, uh, Wentworth Miller, Rosie O'Donnell, Portia de Rossi. Ellen's wife, mm -hmm. uh, Ricky Martin, oh, Ricky as Martin. in Live in La Vida, amazing, mm -hmm. um, Lily Tomlin, Sam Smith. Yes, yeah, Sam Smith, I'm also pretty sure, identifies as non-binary now, which is like super cool to have someone that, because it's, it's fairly non-binary has been one of those words that is like recently spiked in its usage in the community. And so now it's very cool to have. Can you explain more about what non-binary is? Oh, yes, non-binary. Oh, yeah. I don't think okay. we covered that yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. So if we go back to our lesson about like sex and being assigned uh -huh. your gender sex at birth, what we understand is male and female, those two and the Latin, you know, stem word bi meaning two, that's the binary. There is the gender binary, the understanding that gender is a spectrum that is only male or female. Okay. So when we say non-binary, we mean people that don't necessarily fit in those boxes of male or female. And there's a lot of identities that fall under non-binary. There are agender people, which don't really assign with sort of any gender presentation. They don't feel like a male or female. Um, and then there's people that are gender fluid, people that one day might not feel like they have any gender and one day they might feel like a man and one day they might feel like presenting as a woman and it's all very fluid mm -hmm. gender in your presentation in like the way you feel about yourself can change from day to day and it seems it seems really silly to like lock ourselves into these two boxes and say these are what determine the rest of our life and so that is the definition of binary and then what it means to be non not binary and not fit in those boxes. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so I guess just to, just to, so that it's not confusing, I guess. Yes. If So where does non-binary fit in the equation when we're, when we're also using just to get the terminology mm -hmm. LGBTQ yes. are some of those would qualify as non-binary. Is that, does that make Mm -hmm. sense. Okay. So when we sell, we say LGBT, which lesbian, gay, bi, trans, um, the acronym has slowly been growing to the point where we just say LGBTQ plus now uh -huh. um, because the Q being added as queer, which a lot of people consider um, an umbrella term. Mm -hmm. So, okay, in the queer community. Really my question is, is queer used as an umbrella term? Queer is. Or does uh, it mean something specific as gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual mean something mm -hmm. specific. So queer has, um, it's kind of a, like a, like a debatable point in the community, whether or not we should try to reclaim the word queer because it is a, uh, it is a slur, but a lot of people are pro using queer and reclaiming that word because it does sort of encapsulate um, the whole LGBT plus community, um, but we still use LGBT plus because some people that are like less wanting 
to use queer can say that acronym, but queer in LGBTQ plus are like sometimes synonymous mm -hmm. um, when you're saying the queer community, or some people choose to identify as queer rather than one of those specific identities. Uh, queer can also just be understood as not heterosexual or not cis. Some people identify as gender queer and then attach to one of the specific labels for their sexuality. Some people just to like use queer in general. Um, when you asked earlier if non-binary fell under one of those, um, non-binary is often, it often falls under trans or transgender as transgender also means a, it's an umbrella term for anyone that doesn't identify as cisgender. Cisgender, if you've never heard the term, means that you identify with the gender that you were assigned at birth. So if a doctor that was looked be my at next question yes. first, because I figured there were some people who probably hadn't heard that term before. Yeah, yeah. Cisgender. If you were born and the doctor said, "Oh, this is a girl," and then you grow up and you identify as a girl, you could fully say you are cisgender or cis for short. And so then, what does that one stand for again? Uh, which race? Cis. A uh, cis is short for cisgender. So cis gender, meaning you identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. Okay. Um, so if you ever hear someone say cis het, cis is short for cisgender, meaning you're not of trans experience. And then het meaning heterosexual, heterosexual meaning that uh, you're attracted to the gender opposite of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so hopefully you guys, there's going to be a quiz at the end of tonight's show on terms. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I should have broken this down at the beginning. I should have brought flashcards. chart. No, I'm just kidding. Um, most of you are capable of using the Google and answering some further questions if you need to. But we will throw up some of these terms into the, um, into the live stream at the end of the tonight's show um, just to, you know, further explain that stuff for people when they come back, you know, if they come back and they watch the video later or listen yeah. later, they'll have all of that ready. So we'll have some of the terminology worked out for you and clarified or defined um, in that general stream of conversation. Um, so we were talking a little bit about some of our favorite well-known gay people. Yeah, because we left off on Sam Smith, who right. recently come out as non-binary. Non also, Jonathan Van Ness, who's from the Netflix show Queer Eye, also recently came out as non-binary. So it's no longer the Queer Eye guys. It is the Queer Eye people. Oh, wow. How about that? Yeah. There you go. Cool. Um, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, Laverne Cox. Mm -hmm. from oh, Laverne Cox, um, we love. Black. Also was in the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh -huh. reboot that uh -huh. I think Fox did. If you can get your hands on that, it's a pretty fun reboot. And it's also a queer, cool, pretty. So I have to say this because I am old. Er, okay, yes. Er, not old, but older. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you see the original Rocky Horror? Oh, yes, I've okay. seen the Rocky Horror original. So does the new one really compare? <sighs> It's very, it's very different because they've like, okay, so Rocky Horror Picture Show. modernize it. Yeah, the, so the aesthetic is very modernized. And also Rocky Horror Picture Show, what makes it great is it fits in this queer aesthetic of camp, mm -hmm. which um, if you don't understand what camp aesthetic we is. We haven't gone over camp yet. Yeah, we <laughs> haven't gone over camp, which was also the recent theme for the Met Gala. So it's like recently sort of like risen in popularity. Yes. Camp is... We're going to do that in one second. Yes. Because it's 8 o'clock at the top of the hour. I need to do a quick station ID. This is Ooh, WRWK 93.9 yes. FM. My name is Stephanie. You're listening to In the Frequency of Hope. Tonight we're celebrating Pride. My guest is Danny Gonzalez. Yes. Say hi, Danny. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully you are listening on 93.9 or you are listening on theworkfm.org with our audio live stream or... You're watching us on our Facebook live stream. Um, we're giving you as many opportunities as possible to connect with us here at Community Radio. We at The Work FM are using Community Radio to build a bridge from left to right, from city to county, and from neighbor to neighbor. We thrive on your engagement. So we love it that you're watching. We love it when you call in. We love it when you comment on the threads. Um, we love it when you stop by and you hit that donate button and you send us some cash so we can pay some bills. Um, and I will be going over just a little bit more information tonight um, on some spots, sponsorship opportunities. Uh, we'll do that a little bit before the show closes tonight. 
um, and I'll also dig through uh, the announcements folder before we leave tonight. Uh, but right now, we're in the midst of celebrating Pride. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Danny. Okay, yes. We are in the midst of talking about one of my favorite topics, which is camp, which is like an aesthetic. Aesthetic is also maybe a word I should break down. Aesthetic is kind of like enjoying the vibe of how something looks or how you experience it. So camp is an aesthetic that was pretty much like created and revolutionized by queer people. Um, someone described it as camp is imitating the thing, not being the thing. So like we can describe drag queens as very campy because when drag queens perform, a lot of like, a lot of drag queens are men who identify as men when they're out of drag, but when they're in drag, they are imitations of a woman. They're not trying to say, I am a woman. They mm -hmm. are imitating women. And so that is very campy. It is all exaggerated. It's big hair. It's large fake breasts. It's all nothing trying to convince you that it's real, but it's like trying to give the imitation of the thing. And camp kind of reaches this uncanny valley. And we brought this up because of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing up how it's a queer aesthetic largely because of it being revolutionized by drag queens and also being almost like a lack of funding sometimes. Have you ever seen like a very fake set of mm -hmm. something where they didn't have a budget and it was almost eerie? Uh -huh. That kind of gets into this camp zone or very low funded movies you might describe as camp or if you understand the word kitsch or almost quirky, mm -hmm. that's how you can describe camp. And so Rocky Horror Picture Show, the success of it and the feeling of it is very hard to recreate because how do you recreate something? A lot of times camp is unintentional yes. and it's an exaggeration because of like a lack of funding. So how do you recreate that on purpose? Which is why I think a lot of people were very, uh, the recent Met Gala, which if you are in the fashion world, the Met is a museum and every year they have a mm -hmm. giant dress gala and it's themed and celebrities are supposed to show up in theme. The recent theme was camp and a lot of celebrities were very upset at that theme. One, because camp is an exaggeration. You almost have to look ridiculous. Like Lady Gaga was an ambassador and she showed up in this giant pink dress and this ridiculous makeup. Janelle Monet was there and she had like five hats on. It's all ridiculous and exaggeration. A lot of celebrities were upset because one, they don't know how to recreate it. And two, camp is like, it's like never pretty. It's never like very sophisticated. It's all very clunky exaggerated and very kitsch and so if we're like john waters yes 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 john waters and um oh gosh what is the drag queen's name who he worked with oh my gosh divine. yes divine yes big big celebrity drag queen also was uh inspiration for if you like the little mermaid uh ursula uh, her character design was largely inspired by Divine. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, how so, about that? Yeah, another way queer influences have crept into your life. And so, yeah, that answers your question about, like, we were asked, we were talking about Laverne Cox and how she was in the reboot of Rocky Horror Picture Show. I was asked if it lived up to it, and I don't think it's quite possible because I don't think you can recreate, I don't think you can authentically recreate the experience mm -hmm. of how camp the original Rocky Horror Picture Show was. For for those of you who are um, have been around Richmond long enough, you will remember Donnie Corker, also known as Dirt Woman. Did you ever hear of, of Dirt Woman? I have because they precedes probably precedes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Dirt Woman was a drag queen around Richmond for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, and he passed away two years ago. It's pretty. It's fairly recent. Mm -hmm. Two years ago. Um, anyway. Um, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia article does not have any pictures, which is a bummer. Um, but he did all sorts of great fun stuff for, for Richmond as a whole. Um, so, yeah, here's some. There you go. No. Oh, I love that picture. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it, again, it's like obviously fake angel wings that the person is wearing. Uh -huh. So, again, like, it's this camp vibe of something is very yeah. fake and it's meant to feel that way. Here we go. This is Donnie. Oh, yes. As Donnie. Yes, queen. And then there's Donnie dressed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These pictures are so great. Y'all, the, the confidence. There's Donnie dressed up mm -hmm. on the holidays. Um, there we go. He do his big Christmas thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so for, for, um, for folks that are familiar with Richmond history, at least, um, we do have at least one relatively 
famous drag queen mm -hmm. um, that's been performing, was performing around the Richmond area for a very long time. This is one of my favorites, the, the Christmas tree dress. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, another thing about like camp and drag and exaggeration, oh. the large silhouettes that are like sort of meant to hide the body or mm -hmm. exaggerate like feminine features that are obviously fake, but very fun and entertaining. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we're not going to spend the night talking about drag per se, but I now that we're talking a bit more in that about camp itself, mm -hmm. um, which has a relationship to drag, but isn't drag entirely. Not all drag yes. is camp, mm -hmm. and not all camp is drag. Yes, just to clarify. Um, but in comparison, when you're talking about camp versus RuPaul style, mm -hmm. like what he does with the drag race. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that to give folks kind of a... a yes. Yeah, Ru, RuPaul's Drag Race is something that I've elected not to watch, actually, okay. because I've like heard a lot of drag... Que it's, it's like a... It's like a dual-edged sword sometimes when queer popularity reaches the heights of being like among mm -hmm. like the general public because drag shows were in this like queer nightlife space right and i've like touched on why queer nightlife is so important it provides a safe place where queer mm -hmm. people can be queer but with like the rising popularity of rupaul's drag race you find more and more like bachelorette parties of like um like heterosexual women wanting to go into queer spaces and enjoy oh like enjoy drag as a part of like their bachelorette celebration or or like people that are like het cis fans of RuPaul's Drag Race they like enter queer spaces and then suddenly there's less and less queer recognition in like these very few spaces we have okay. and also the commercial success of RuPaul's Drag Race sometimes um the queens can become less um experimental in a way I'd stand by the fact that like drag is an art form where aesthetics are strong and there's experimentation and there's play on gender but like RuPaul's Drag Race sometimes begins like queens begin to have to like cater to a cis audience so there becomes this image of what a drag queen should look like and a lot of times that's also kind of against camp in a in a okay a way there's okay. a video that explains this very well i will give you the link at the end of this show because sure. i'm not as familiar with like drag queen history but i do I do know that. So while I like to support queens individually and like a lot of times, like sometimes even like, yeah, I like to support them individually, but I don't always necessarily support this show because RuPaul is also quickly becoming one of those figures that Im are important and iconic as a part of like queer history and like deserve to be respected for that way. But like maybe sometimes hasn't picked up on, um, how much the queer liberation movement and how much our vocabulary has changed. So there's yeah. like a lot of mixed feelings actually about RuPaul in the queer community okay. and the success of this show. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all, but I went, I went on a tangent there. That's okay. No, I think all of that stuff's really important because it is one of those things that is accessible to people who aren't going to clubs and, you know, for people who are either allies or friends and neighbors and just curious you know, that's one of the things that is mm -hmm. accessible, um, where we don't, where, where people aren't going to feel like they are encroaching on somebody else's space by mm -hmm. showing up at a club or, mm -hmm. or, or perhaps making themselves uncomfortable by showing up in a club, whatever that is. Yeah. But, um, you know, so what is being offered up mm -hmm. in the public domain as, as a window in? Yeah. Yeah. It's very um, important. And that's disconcerting to hear from someone within the community that, maybe that window isn't the best one to look through. Um, I don't feel totally comfortable saying like, oh, you shouldn't show up in these spaces, but it's very important to, I mean, like the financial support is like important. Like that is how like a lot of drag, drag queens make their money. They can make good money off of like bachelorette parties coming and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it is important to like when you support queer, support queer people to not make yourself like the center of attention or make it about you. I've like read stories online where queer people will go to a queer club and then they'll like like if it's a queer woman they'll hit on a woman that's there and then if they're heterosexual and they just happen to be there sometimes they might act offended in some way as if they didn't know what space they were entering or there's a lot of people that like to um sometimes people try to be allies but then um like the general rule of thumb is that you shouldn't speak over is that you should uplift other voices so like taylor swift has recently sort of gotten in hot water over that with her recent um 
song, I think it's called like You Need to Calm Down or something, where it's mm-hmm. like she has released a new song that she is like trying to describe as like a queer anthem that is like meant to uplift the queer community, but she is a straight cisgender woman trying to describe struggles of being queer and motivation instead of maybe uplifting like an actual queer person song. And it's also conveniently her releasing this song during Pride Month also as she's announcing a new album. So like things become to get blurred as to whether or not you're being an ally for capitalistic means, like gaining money or gaining recognition or whether you're like an honest to God ally. Uh Um, So like things just get very fuzzy sometimes and like the way we show allyship, I think um, just like the best way to be an ally is like if you enjoy queer content, support queer content like monetarily and also like allow queer people to continue making that content without feeling like they have to cater to you um, or like your audience like just try, sometimes like try not try not to make it about you because like a lot of the a lot of things in the world are already about you so absolutely okay. and so very much like um one one of our earlier callers started to say something about you know the difference between whatever gay pride and straight pride mm-hmm. and i think you and i had even discussed that a little bit before the show mm-hmm. tonight whether or not that was something that we would need to perhaps address um, during during the program tonight. And because it's surfaced, perhaps that is something that we need to talk about. Very much like um, from my perspective, and again, I'm from the outside looking in, but you know, when I when I work on stories where the central characters don't look like me and their lives don't reflect anything that looks like something I know from my mm-hmm. own lived experience. Um, it just becomes really important for me to start asking a lot of questions mm-hmm. and then to, to, I'm looking for commonality. Mm-hmm. I want to find out what those things are because mm-hmm. that's how we develop community. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not by staying focused on our differences, Kevin. Uh, it is more that. about finding our community. What, what, what is it that each of us has to offer to make this whole thing work? Because no matter how I feel about you, Kevin, uh, we're still sharing the same air and water and stuff, mm. you know? Um, so I think that rather than being focused on, maybe that's the wrong way to say that. For me, what I recognize is that in order for you to have more rights doesn't mean that I'm losing any rights. Mm-mm-mm. Nope. It just means that we are all going to have the same rights mm-hmm. um, because rights are not like pie. They simply exist. Um, and that's not more to give someone means less for someone else. Um, I literally lose nothing by acknowledging the humanity of any of the other people that I come across. I stand to gain a whole lot in it, but I lose absolutely nothing in the process. Mm-hmm. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times um, it's important. We have like a tendency as a society when we try to advocate for equal rights and things, sometimes we'll go from a privilege is not a scale, but for like simplicity, sometimes we like try to move downwards so we like try to think of um like like it's not a coincidence that like the face of like the queer like marriage rights and queer advocacy is typically like a white male gay person rather than let's consider a disabled black trans person but if we like met the needs of like a disabled black trans person then we would already be meeting the needs of someone that is like a white gay man do you get what i mean that it's like um we should be more empathetic to the most vulnerable people in society because we gain more when we're already considering all the problems and all the disadvantages that those people face we wouldn't have to work backwards and then be like continuing to step towards something if we already considered them as we're building things we wouldn't have to potentially reach any further because it's not pie yeah I lo- it's a very simple, um, a simple picture I'm drawing there, but I mean it. Um, 
so when we are considering allyship, mm -hmm. um, this is a wonderful, it's a wonderful learning opportunity for me. Um, because with the first caller, I was so surprised. I wasn't surprised to get pushed back on a topic because that happens mm -hmm. on my show. I was surprised by the vehemence and the immediate use of foul language because mm -hmm. that's pretty big when you're on air on radio. <laughs> so it really caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, for those of you who are in the studio so you can't see Danny up close and personal the way that I can, is the way that it didn't... you. You didn't even miss a beat because no. the, clearly this is not new and different for you. And so that's just a part and parcel of whatever your experience has already been. Yeah. Um, and that leads me to two more thoughts, one of which is, I'm really sorry that that's been your experience. That blows. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, for the rest of you, quit it. <laughs> yeah. Queer people always have to, you know, it's one of those, when, when you go to queer spaces or you talk about queer topics, you prepare for the worst, hope for the best sort of situation. When people started talking about like the straight pride parade, one of the things I went to Instagram to talk about was like, oh, how do you prepare for a straight pride parade? Because the way I've prepared for going to DC pride the past two years is I take a lanyard and I make myself an emergency ID that states like my name, my contact information, who I'm traveling with, my blood type, because I have to be prepared for shootings and bombings and hate crimes because that just has to be reality, even in like queer spaces where I would like to be comfortable and I would like to celebrate my identity. I can't just like comfortably do that. There's actually been like a lot of talk in the community of changing the idea of safe spaces and changing them to brave spaces because like a lot of times we have to recognize that like we really can't be safe no matter we where we go. And so like I have to be prepared for shootings and things. And then um, I like I told you a little bit about this earlier, which like, oh, by the way, trigger warning, we're talking about hate crimes and um, shootings and things. If that's triggering for yes. anyone, maybe turn away. Um, so I was at this like previous DC Pride a couple of weeks ago and I was near DuPont Circle, which is sort of like maybe like where people tend to meet for the parade and things. It was parade day and there was either like a misfiring or some people say a bar barricade fell or something, but there was a loud noise that like we are a, that, like we responded to as a community. We don't know like who shouted it first, but someone just shouted run because it sounded like a gunshot and that's like not out of the realm of what we can do. Right. And so I was close enough that where I had to have the experience at 21 years old of having to feel like I was running for my life for 10 minutes of hiding calling someone I like loved dearly who I wasn't with, who I knew was like near DuPont Circle. They didn't respond to me for 15 minutes. And until it was confirmed that it was not a shooting, I had to sit with that reality that that's something I could have lived with at 21 years old and that someone was not responding to me. I didn't know if they were alive or dead for like a good 15 minutes. And that is just something that I had to like, I knew going into Pride and we're like we're celebrating with each other we're also putting a massive target on our backs so like things mm -hmm. like that like I had like I have to know the risk and when I you just like go on like a radio talk show to talk about queer things I have to be like ready for this and even when I like get ready to leave the house in the mornings I have to weigh like the odds of what I look like like a lot of times I have to wear makeup so that I like present maybe more femininely to people because if people see me as like a, like a cis woman who just has a short haircut, they treat me a lot nicer than if I don't have makeup and I look a lot more like someone um, trying to pass as a man and they like, like can see that I'm like, they are guessing that I am transgender, then they're a lot more willing to be hateful towards me. So like even just simple things like getting dressed in the morning, I have to, I have to consider my safety. Um, I did. Now, full disclosure, women, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of my female listeners are going to say yes, that we take a whole lot of thought into our appearance for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, that to me simply smacks of some of the, the patriarchy that we all live under. And I mm -hmm. think that's the part that's really damaging, particularly toward gay men. Mm -hmm. Um, and gay women. Really, really. 
Yeah, everyone, everyone stands to benefit from embracing femininity and feminism. Feminism is not just a movement for women. It's for everyone. Because mm-hmm. if it's safe to be feminine, then don't don't men who want to be feminine benefit as well. It's not just yeah. about women. Yeah. It's about everyone. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with me tonight, mm-hmm. um, with, with our listeners as well, but, um, it's been wonderful learning new things tonight. Um, so who else did I have up here? I had some other stuff up here. Oh yes. I totally just other, dropped oh, that no, large okay, emotional. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, because we need to, we need to talk about and process some of those things that are really uncomfortable. Um, it makes me uncomfortable that we had callers that were less than pleasant Mm -hmm. this evening. Um, but that is in fact part of what happens on the other side of this radio wall. Um, and that's exactly what the show was designed for was to Mm -hmm. go ahead and discuss those things. So I super, super appreciate your willingness to, to be on the other side of that. Um, and, uh, I guess I'm going to have to show some appreciation, even for the callers, even though not your messages were not appreciated, but, you know, I appreciate you participating all the same. Uh, <laughs> right? Maybe not, um, but... <laughs> right? Something like that. Um, and, and representing a part of the conversation that neither you nor I would have brought up. Mm-hmm. And so I do have to show appreciation for that because yes. there are some things we probably wouldn't have failed yeah. to discuss tonight. Yeah, it was, it was a good um, reminder to go back and... Yeah. Um, Make Talk sure. about some like building blocks and terminology that have become yeah. such a part of my life. There's so much gay lingo. Oh my gosh, y'all. There is so much gay lingo. We need to make a chart. Oh my gosh. Ooh, sometimes I like to play um, a guessing game with my friends where I'll throw an obscure gay lingo at them and I have to make them like guess what the word means. Oh, there's so many niche words, but like those niche words have become a part of my life and they're just a regular part of my vernacular now because I'm in this. Give me a couple. I'm just curious. Oh, um, oh, dear Lord. Um, doppelbanger. Okay. What's a Doppelbanger. Doppelbanger. Yes. Okay. Um, Doppelbanger is a word for, okay, there's this phenomenon, like, especially in, like, gay men, but, like, anyone in the career community can fall under it. Um, When you're dating someone that is, like, the same gender presentation as you, there's more odds of you looking a lot alike. And there's, there's this phenomenon, like, especially among gay men where they like to date people that look like them or they don't even realize they're doing it, but people that do this, like seriously and like do it time and time again you can call them a doppelbanger a, like a pun on the word doppelganger someone that looks like right. you but you would like to wah, wah, get it on with them <laughs> okay um next oh other words oh okay um how this this is a radio show how explicit a lot of these are fairly explicit so, so we'll be avoiding those okay okay Just um light ones <laughs> Keep it kind of PG. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, now they're all leaving my brain. I'm trying to think of PG there are no ones. PG ones. I mean, like, the, like the queer. Okay, it is important to recognize like the queer experience is more than like um, than A just like our just sexual sex. lives, right. but like also like because so much of like. There's, there's so many subcategories and com- communities that there are a lot of labels and there's like a lot of slang terms to sort of help right. you get around to figure out like what communities you. F- you fit into right. um so we can t- um uh bear let's go with bear do you know what a bear is i think so okay I think yes a, hit okay. me, hit me so with that a guess. bear is a gay, a gay man yes that's really hairy yes yes large and hairy like a bear what about but there's a sub cat there's a step almost like below that that Otter is now a term that is being used. You know what an otter is? I do not. It's almost like a bear. It, it's like a gay man that is hairy, but not. A, but that is not large like a bear. They're small and sleek and hairy like an otter. Sleek and hairy. Yes. Well, there you go. Small and hairy. So there's just like all these. There's all these terms, and there's like even more like um, butch and femme, which are um, uh terms of like categories for a uh, lesbian women butch meaning someone might like present more masculinely even though there's more to that but that's like a simplified version of it and then femme being like a lesbian who presents more femininely um 
So there's just like a lot of terms like that that people like to use as ways of finding more community. And then there's some of that wah, 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 words that help you find people in other ways. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so at some point, you're going to have to set up like a game night where people come out and do like lingo bingo or something. So oh, gay learn. lingo bingo. Well, yes. These words. <laughs> <laughs> lingo bingo. That's funny. Um, Let me see. What are we doing? What are we doing? We're doing 830. It's almost 830. I do have one question that somebody posted that I wanted to yes. ask you where you're at. So Herschel asked, which of the Democratic presidential candidates running in 2020 do you believe will do the best for the entire alphabet community? after a few protections have been compromised by the current administration? I'll be straight up. I don't so assuming that some of them happen because we're going to fight really hard to make sure that none of those protections are lost in the process. But do you have, is there a particular candidate who's running in that's that's thrown their hat in the ring for 2020 that that you find particularly appealing because you think that it's going to work out well for the LGBTQ community. I don't think I'm that knowledgeable about politics, which is like one of my downfalls. All queer people have room to grow in these things. And I don't particularly know a specific candidate that I want, but I, I do know that like when it comes down to it, there's 12 options and people are very passionate about those options. Um, whoever wins the primary as like the dedicate democratic candidate, I just know that I will be voting for regardless of how much I agree or disagree with them compared to the other 12. I just, or 11, I just know that I need it to not be how it is right now. Um, because I don't think, I don't think there's a democratic candidate in there that could be worse than what we're currently living through, or at least for me. Right. Yes. Understandable. Understandable. Um, so, Herschel, I don't have an answer for your question yet. Um, I will say this. I have been, um, and, and I, it's not really my place to answer the question. Um, oh, but, but I would, I, I, I trust you. <clears throat> I think um, th that um, Buttigieg is getting a fair amount of support uh, because he himself is gay. Okay. And he's out. Um so I think he's getting a fair amount of support from the community and that seems thoroughly reasonable because people want to be represented um, and they want to see someone that looks like them, um, you know, in government, in movies, you know, in business all the way through. Um, I would have to deeply look at more of his policy to see if I felt like there was a specific benefit for that community under any of his policy suggestions because mm -hmm. I just don't think there's anything applicable that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of any in particular that would be intentionally damaging for that community mm -hmm. um, being that they'd be running on the democratic platform. Although I can certainly see that there are probably some of them that would be willing to make compromises that others wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Um, so Herschel, you know where this is going to go. All things lead back to Marianne 2020. Um, <laughs> and if you haven't checked out her platform yet, do it now, do it. Um, mostly because in regards to the conversation that we're having tonight, her platform says if somebody else can weaponize fear mm -hmm. as a political force, mm -hmm. Why can't we use love as a mm -hmm. political force in opposition? Mm -hmm. That's my candidate. Yes. <laughs> um, and I really like um, her history in particular with the LGBT community. Um, and she, she launched a nonprofit back in the 80s specifically to um, provide food, housing, and uh, medical needs for um, AIDS patients mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And that organization is still going today. So apparently she knows how to hold a meeting and get some work done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
those are my kind of folks that I want um, working in policy. Um, so hopefully that will satisfy um, your question, Herschel. Sorry that we didn't have something a little more specific. Um, and I'm going to scroll through here real quick and see if any more questions have popped up. Okay, uh, so I'm going to read a couple of these comments aloud. Um, Having studied the Bible closely, I could say there's no valid support to justify the vicious anti-queer prejudice being spewed in the name of Jesus. In 2003, back when the Supreme Court ruled on Lawrence v. Texas, I wrote a brief exploration of what the Bible actually says about homosexuality. Not much. And then there's a link. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you are interested in finding out more about that, you can go to the live stream feed and you can pick up the link to that style weekly piece. Um, the next comment says that that absurd alphabetic set alphabetic salad that is now so trendy. Isn't it ironic that someone bold enough to come out is too timid to use the word queer? Queer is a more historic, encompassing, pronounceable, and hence more effective branding. I agree that it is less of a mouthful, but I do want to, like, I do, as, like, a younger person who, like, maybe when that uh, was used less of a slur, maybe in, like, my times, I, like, I try to be, like, conscious of, like, how that word has been used against people and yeah. how it has affected like their uh, upraising. But I, I do, I do think like as a community, we're moving towards its usage more, especially since an academia, it's already being used. Okay. So there's a question that's come in that I'm confused by, but we'll see what happens. Uh, have you heard of the new, apostolic reformation or dominionism and what role do religious extremists play in cultural response to queer rights i oh questions oh okay. okay um i'm not familiar okay. with those words and uh what was the end of that question does it was it like how religious extremists what impact? role do religious extremists play in the cultural response to queer rights i feel like, I feel like extremist voices are always the loudest runs right you never it's like much easier to hear hate than it is like to hear love sometimes because it just sticks out so much and so i think like extremist hateful religions oftentimes they they wedge something between the identities of being queer and being religious like there's so many like queer people that i've talked to in my life that are just vehemently like anti religion because extremist religions have like caused us mm -hmm. like so much pain and there's been so much hatred spewed against us mm -hmm. and i think that like gives a lot of people almost like an identity crisis. Like a lot of um, religious queer people feel like they have to choose between one or the other because like extremists will say that you can't have one or the other. Or if you are queer and you're religious, you just have to accept the fact that you're going to go to hell or face some sort of repulsion like that. When I think like I've met like plenty of religious queer people that would say that's simply not true but like a lot of times it's harder to like find those voices of love and acceptance from the church just because extremist values of hate just speak so much louder and stick out so much more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um very quickly i'm gonna i'm gonna do a quick shout out just in case um you happen to be listening tonight chrissy stroop if you are listening tonight would you call in because I think that you could add something to this part of the conversation. Uh, the phone number is 804-464-1089. Um, Chris has been on the show before talking oh, yes. about dominionism mm -hmm. um, and also happens to be queer. Mm -hmm. so oh, there you go. Um, so there you go. So um, that would be an interesting point of view to oh. include tonight as well. Yes. And also just to acknowledge that I'm one person with like one um, experience. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think they can listen to like one queer person and get like their opinion on the community. But like I cannot speak on behalf of the entire community because I do not represent all the identities right. within it. So um, 
if you are interested in a lot of these topics, you should find out like different people's point of views that like aren't necessarily mine because I have like a very limited point of view. I do my best to listen to other queer people's experiences, even though I do have a queer experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So listen to a lot of queer people because there's a lot of queer people around you. There you go. And they all have different opinions and ideas about things. Um, we would like to think that there's like a homogenous group that we just know things about, but that's kind of not how it works pretty much any time that we try to think about a group of people. Um, regardless of whatever we think their unifying characteristics might be. Um, so where are we now? We are getting toward... We've got about 20 minutes left, so I do want to encourage folks, uh, if anybody else wants to um, ask a question or make a comment, we've got about 20 minutes left of the show tonight, so go ahead and get those calls in. It's 804-464-1089. Um, and I'm going to mention a couple of different things because there are some things that we brought out tonight, brought up tonight, that I just want to make sure that we're clarifying for people so that they know, um, know about it. Um, so... One of, the, one of the organizations that I mentioned earlier this evening is Lambda Legal, and I just want to tell people who they are, where they came from. Um, Lambda Legal starts, um, the story starts with a band of volunteer lawyers that were struggling to break new ground for LGBT people in the American justice system. From that uh, came a national civil rights group that has had unprecedented success. Continuing to this day, their work improves life for a diverse community of LGBTQ people um, and those with HIV who were penalized or barely recognized under the laws across the nation. Um, and so if you are in need of assistance, uh, Lambda Legal is one of your options um, and that is www.lambdalegal.org. Um, if you're seeking assistance with a legal matter that involves your sexual orientation, gender identity, or HIV, please call them in your region and ask for the legal help desk. You can visit them online or you can call them. There are varying um, regional offices, but I will give you the national headquarters office. Telephone number is 212-809. 8585. And there were another, um, there was another organization or two that you mentioned. So let's see, there was yes. PFLAG. Yes, there's PFLAG, the Human Rights Campaign, which a lot of people are familiar HLC. with. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D. And also I'd mentioned Side by Side, which is a local Richmond community um, sort of based mm -hmm. organization that helps queer youth um, on one half of the end. They're sort of like a home base for queer youth leadership activities. They lead a queer um, youth prom where like anyone can feel free to come with whoever they like and present however they like at their prom because not all Ooh. queer people can experience prom safely in their own high schools. Uh -huh. And also another end of what they do is that they pair um, queer youth affected by um, home instability. They can pair them with like this sort of foster home situation. So if you are someone with like a spare bedroom and a, maybe a surplus of income, maybe consider becoming a registered side-by-side -side home so that a queer youth in your community can um, have some home stability for a while. Also, you can volunteer Very your time cool. with them. It's Very, Very cool. cool. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, PFLAG. PFLAG was founded in 1973 after the simple act of a mother publicly supporting her gay son. Um, so this is the nation's largest family and ally organization. Uniting people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer with families, friends, and allies, PFLAG is committed to advancing equality through its mission of support, education, and advocacy. There are 400 chapters and 200,000 supporters crossing multiple generations of American families throughout all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. It's a grassroots network um, with 13 volunteer regional directors. So if you would like to get further information, I would encourage you to visit PFLAG, that's P-F-L-A-G dot O-R-G. Um, the Human Rights Campaign um, has a big 
ad for money right now. There we go. Yes, the raising human money rights. for pride. That's great. There we go. Good stuff. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign represents a force of more than three million members and supporters nationwide. It is the largest national lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transgender, and queer rights civil organization. HRC envisions a world where LGBTQ people are insured of their basic equal rights and can be open, honest, and safe at home, at work, and in the community. Yes. Would you like to talk about another organization? Um, let's talk about the, okay, so the Trevor Project, I'm fairly certain uh, they run a queer-focused suicide hotline. I would recommend donating to them. They, or like even just like following them on Instagram and shouting them out, uh, unfortunately, a lot of queer youth are heavily affected by bullying and home instability, home rejection and stuff, which can lead to a lot of suicidal thoughts. So it's important that like if they call a suicide hotline, that they have people that will understand them, which is a large part of what the Trevor Project um, works with. They work with mental health advocacy and hotlines. Project. Yes. Okay. Um, make sure that we put that up there too. Yes. Okay. Also. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Question. You are ready. Yes, awesome. I am. All right. Uh, we have another caller online. His name is Chris. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for calling in tonight. Yeah, thank you for putting on this great discussion and uh, good job handling that abusive caller. Thank you. And um, I really just felt this big cheer when your, when your guest said that wouldn't men also benefit if they wanted to have any feminine that's what we call, I should say, feminine or effeminate ex expressions. And um, uh, something I would say to my fellow men is, uh, I have a, a health situation that has really forced me to investigate the ways I use this body that are self-abusive, and that many of those ways come from uh, ways that we are pressured from our earliest time as boys to deny certain parts of our human existence in pursuit of making other people feel less uncomfortable because they want us to represent boys and then men as they think it should be. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, in the book Masks of Masculinity, the author points out that the same age at which boys are pressured to reduce their emotional expressions, the range of emotional expressions, is the same age that boys suicide rate skyrockets mm -hmm. to five times that of girls. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't stop there. Uh, you know, as, as we go along and we take pride in essentially keep treating our body like some kind of tool, um, you know, it lasts for a couple decades like that. But you see that men don't last as long as women. We shoot each other more often. We strangle each other more often. We suicide. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's something like for every time a gun is used in self-defense, five or six times it's used as suicide. And, and most of those are guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when guys suddenly realize, gee, this tool just really isn't working anymore, not, not like that, then so many men are suddenly left to feel like, wow, I have no purpose in this world. There's no point in being here. And then that anger, that rage can turn outward into mass killings and notice that most mass killers kill themselves at the end of it so it's it's truly insane i, I would even say that that something like incel which is a really curious term because incel is invented by a gay woman but then as is so often the case that the phrase is hijacked by a bunch of uh you know freaked out white guys and uh and so now it's associated with with guys who can't get laid, even though it was originally phrased by a gay woman. Um, and so it's curious to me that if you think about it, when you read some of these incel columns, and, I mean, it's, you got to have a strong stomach, don't eat before you go in, but if you go into the rabbit hole and you start reading their comments, you quickly realize that they're not actually involuntarily celibate. The phrase contains multitude of mind methods. Okay, I was going to say what we should have said there. Uh, a multitude of, of inconsistencies that are self-destructive. And just to give you an example, it's very common for men in these incel columns to, to, to write very derogatively of women as simply receptacles for their semen. And it, it hit me when I'm reading some of these. If you say things like that to yourself, you're going to start saying them to your friends. And then you're going to start saying them in public. And that means 
you have chosen to be celibate because you are chasing off the very people that you claim to want connection with by thinking of them that way and then speaking of them that way and then treating them that way. So therefore, you're not really involuntarily celibate. So it's literally insane. It's it should be in the DSM. So we then let other men face a bill of goods, a a um, a ridiculous definition of masculinity that makes our lives less emotionally deep, brutish, sure, and for what? But why do we put up with this shaming? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's important though. So I don't have gender dysphoria. I don't wish I were born a woman. I do wish I could cuddle like a lot of women do, but that's a cultural thing. It's not a gender thing, um, other than we've defined it that way, and that men have done to each other and other women makes us isolated and lonely as we get older. But that's not because I was born a guy. That's because what we do with being a guy. Mm -hmm. That's what our culture does with being a guy. It's nothing intrinsic to having been born a guy or a woman. And that's why I really cheered when you said that if guys can express things that we would refer to as femininity or our feminine sides, it would benefit all of us. Mm -hmm. We would get less cancer. We would get less heart disease. We would kill each other less. We might be more nurturing. We might find connection and less isolation. I mean, there's really no downside except that I'd say 1% of men who were bullies decided they could shame other boys and then men into being their tools. And that's really what it comes down to. Masculinity, as we currently define it, is a shaming system by which 1% mm -hmm. of the guys convince 99% of the guys to become their tools. Yes, you can refer that to um, as toxic masculinity if you're interested in this. Um, I would suggest looking up toxic masculinity maybe rather than looking up, uh, you brought up the word insul, which like I'll briefly maybe explain what the word insult is. Um, so there's a, a website called Reddit and there's like almost like chat forums online where men who believe they're almost like a lesser subcategory of men who are not like attractive to women they believe they have like this like inferior bone structure and that they're somehow oppressed for not um being attractive to women they've created this hateful subculture online where it's men bashing men they will take it from a heterosexual woman if you're not getting it it's because of something you did yeah it's like and they like they like find all these reasons to blame like biology and they say that women are evil and it's these men hating themselves and a lot of times they'll post selfies just so people can tell them that they're like ugly so they have a reason to hate themselves i suggest not even going on those forums yeah for real or even <laughs> this goes to all extremist um uh points of view don't debate an extremist because that's how extremists are made is that they debated someone mm -hmm. and they found some little thing in the debate that the other person was saying that hooked them in so i don't suggest uh -huh. giving like any points of view or anything to insults if you're interested in learning more about insult culture i would look up toxic masculinity read a general um forum and then honestly look into what feminism actually is because a lot of people think feminism is about women wanting to overthrow men but like really it's just like want us wanting equality for everyone this goes back to what i said earlier about if we look at the if we serve the most vulnerable people and most vulnerable people in our society then really we've taken care of everyone so if we make it a lot of people like will look down on women for being a certain way or being feminine if we go ahead and we make it okay for women to be feminine and we embrace femininity for everyone then men are also allowed to be more feminine and if everyone's allowed to be feminine and everyone's allowed to be masculine then also gender borders and stereotypes are broken down and then ultimately we're just left with everyone being able to express themselves they with they the way they want to with love and with acceptance and i think i think feminism is for i truly believe that femininity will heal and save the world and that is for everyone i think feminism is about peace and about acceptance and I suggest people look into that um and yeah feminism yeah, and, and avoid those together. incel chat rooms yeah just just avoid it completely <laughs> well I'm curious I, I end up down many different rabbit holes 
on the internet as well as other places. Uh, I I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh all the time. I'm so sorry. Just to see where they're coming from. I still tune into Christian radio now and then just to see what crazy spews out of there. I suggest if you're interested in learning more about extremist point of views or or anyone here that's interested in learning more about queer living, there's a great YouTube channel uh, called ContraPoints where a trans woman named Natalie Wynn goes, she does the work that you're doing for you where she goes into um, these horrible extremist, violently misogynistic communities. She finds the debates that they're talking about in her previous experience as like a philosophy major. She goes ahead, she goes ahead and she breaks it all down for you in a way that is entertaining. She does drag and very educational. She's broke, she breaks things down in a term that's highly understandable. So you don't actually have to interact with any of these communities, but you can listen to someone who is queer give their life experiences and sort of like debunk a lot of these feelings. Again, that resource would be ContraPoints on. Well, that's a, that's a really great um, thing. I'm going to check that rabbit hole out now, too. <laughs> yes, uh, go ahead. Please do. But, you know, I've always, I've always been interested in the intersection of places and things, you know, where the, where the forest meets the field or the, or the beach or the ocean meets the land. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of interchange of things happen. So I'm probably going to end up back in those horrible rabbit holes out of curiosity, more of a curiosity if nothing mm -hmm. else, but also I feel like once a guy gets to a certain awareness, um, if we want to live in this better world, it, it's got to be like a pair of pliers. It can't just be just say no from the women. It can't just be guys. It has to be both. It has to be both people coming at it like a pair of pliers from two sides to squeeze the problem, and then once you've got the handles on it, now you can really do something with it. I mean, can you imagine trying to do repair work with a pair of chopsticks compared to a pair of pliers, it's, you know, I feel like I have to learn what I can from you so I can go forth and then speak in an authentic male voice, having been in construction my whole entire life, I'm familiar with the lingo, I'm familiar with the correct cadence and the use of tone of voice, so I feel like I can say things that they might hear at least differently mm -hmm. than they yes. would hear from you, or they might not listen to you at all, that would vary by each person, of course. But I think that some of them are going to listen to me, but they're not going to listen to you, and vice versa. And that's why it really has to be, at some level, a little bit of everyone, from wherever perspective they're coming from, yes, yes. coming at this problem, from wherever they think they can work it. So I'm not going to talk on an incel column the same way I'm talking to you right now, mm -hmm. because I want to reach them. And so I'm going to use their language and turn it around back on them. Mm -hmm. So I remember debating one of them online. When they said that, you know, like you said, they felt they were subhuman. And I said, well, guys like to think we're logical, right? Okay, how's this for logic? In most cases, you were the result of a man and a woman you know, getting together in such a way she got pregnant. And other than horrible rape cases, most of the time, they liked each other. They found something positive in each other. They were attracted to each other. And half of you comes from each one of them. That means half of you came from people who liked each other. So... That means it, you're no more genetically deformed than they are, and they liked each other. So I think you can figure out that your problem with connection is probably mostly not how you look, and it's mostly how you use the life you have right now. Uh, I appreciated what you said about how people will maybe be more receptive to maybe listening to you rather than me. I think that's the major important thing about being an ally is that, like, no, a lot of like people will disregard my opinions and think I'm like just selfish and want to advocate for myself. But if like someone else advocates for me, then they're shown that like compassion and like love, it really benefits everyone, which is why allyship is important and being educated about like what you're going to ally, be an ally for is important. And, um, being yeah. able to that intersectionality, it's, it's also important. And I thank you for, um, being educated in the topics that you care about. Well, you bring up a really good point, although you may not have intended it, which is that I've had a very rocky road at, at trying to be an ally because I, I never really thought of, I never went into this thinking I was going to be an ally, so I never Googled ally. I just went into it um, kind of angry at the viciousness, and it's just like, you're making this a horrible life, for everybody, including yourself, mm -hmm. would you chill the hell out? And that's why I initially went into it. And I wanted to understand women's lived experience better uh, out of 
out of wanting to understand so that I could express it effectively. And so I would go into feminist debate areas, and they would think that I was playing a what about game, or they they thought that I was just there to to, to harass them. Mm-hmm. And it was partly because I hadn't learned a lot of the language. I, I spoke in a language like a construction worker might, because that's the language I knew. And and I didn't know this right away. And so I had some, unfortunately, got to experience very abusive feminists, because guess what? People are people, and they come in every kind, and some assholes come in every kind. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I ran into a lot of female assholes. And there's the white knights who, like, pretend to be their guardians and and will attack me. Mm -hmm. So the the bottom line is I didn't learn anything there. Mm -hmm. I had to go forth and, like, find places that where I wasn't just dismissed as, oh, another guy pretending to be what about? Mm -hmm. Or he's doing the devil advocate thing, but he doesn't really care what you say. I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, this was a real question, but, you know, it's text. It's literally two-dimensional text on a screen. They can't hear my tone of voice. They can't hear the cadence. Some of them read it as sarcasm, and there's not much I can do about it. Um, so if you know some resources where men who are honestly curious, want to be better allies, can go to have a, a discussion, um, maybe you might consider passing that on as well. Yes, I will do my best. I'll think of some resources to leave and... Also, yeah, I think you brought up a good point about like having to ask people for clarification and having to learn language through other people. And I think that um, points me to something I've been wanting to like, sort of touch on is emotional labor. Um, a lot of, uh, if you're not familiar with the term, a lot of times we think of labor as something that is just physical that we put out. But a lot of times it, it is physically exhausting and mentally exhausting to put out emotional labor, which is what a lot of minority groups have to have to give so like if you're going to like uh like women chat forums and you're expecting to be like educated like yes valiant valiant effort but sometimes dudes like do come in with um like bad attitudes and so women are used to performing in these spaces a lot of emotional labor and sometimes using this labor in a way that ends up being useless um and then even like when someone does have an honest to god question Maybe if a woman who's used to putting out emotional labor or if you're asking like a queer person queer questions or a black person questions about the black experience, they've probably got this question a thousand times and they've had to go through that emotional experience so many times. Like how many times have I had to live, relive the experience of like a lot of my traumatic like childhood events just so someone could better understand me? I've built up a lot of emotional strength, but like not everyone has and it can still be taxing so like i really appreciate you calling in and appreciating like what we've been talking about because it shows that the emotional labor i've been doing is like not for nothing um and i think that's something we should all be receptive of if you're someone who's like trying to learn about like any sort of topic really genuinely thank the person that's sharing their lived experience with you because they have just unleashed like a lot of emotions that are probably very tough for them to relive those experiences and those emotions. So that's a great point. I, I just learned the term emotional labor this year. Oh yes, it um, is something everyone I should say it was the year I technically it was twenty eighteen that I mm-hmm. heard the term and started looking into it. But yeah, I, I didn't even hear of such a thing until within this year. Um yeah. so you know we don't teach these things uh in any place that I go formally for anything. Um, so there's a lot of bumbling around. Look at people learning stuff on the Work FM. Woohoo! Yay! Yeah. <laughs> that's what it's for. Yes, that's the work. That is literally the work. The work to become who we want to become. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for calling in tonight, Chris. I'm going to let you yes. go because we are almost at 9 o'clock. I've got a couple things to say before we close tonight. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Have a great so night. Thank you so much for calling in tonight. Good night. Thank you all. Bye. What a right. sweet person. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so a couple of different things that I want to touch on really quickly because we are going to have to wrap up because it's 9 o'clock. But we also brought up the terminology intersectionality, and I don't know that we ever really covered that well. Mm-hmm. And I think that you're a wonderful spokesperson for it. You. Um, because as we, as you and I were discussing earlier, you have the intersectionality covering over several things that are um, uh, not, uh, different. not things. Uh, characteristics Mm -hmm. or classifications of Mm -hmm. humans Um, when we're talking about let's let's define intersectionality Mm -hmm. I guess is the first thing to do and then because this is something that you face both 
well, excuse me, on a myriad of planes. Mm -hmm. That's yes. that is a way that I can say yes. that. Um, <laughs> Um, describe that a little bit for folks. Yes. Thank so you. intersectionality, if we break it down and we look at the main word, we find intersect, right? So we all hold multiple identities in our life. Um, someone is not just a gay person. They are a gay person plus their race, plus their income level, plus their immigration status, plus uh, their level of physical ability. They are plus all of these things. So someone that is a uh, white, cis gay man is experiencing the world much different than someone that may be um, experiencing life as an illegal immigrant um, who is also autistic, who is also a person of color, who is also queer. Like, they may share like one aspect of identity, which is queerness, but that impacts their life totally differently. Like both these people may go to pride, but one person um, may realize they can enter more spaces than another person may be in a wheelchair. So even their queer experiences are defined by another aspect of their identity. And that's why it's important to talk about intersectionality and make sure when we're advocating for community groups like the LGBT community, we make sure we're not just focusing on uh, just gay rights, make sure we're advocating for everyone in our community because we should love everyone in our community. Mm -hmm. So many times the the just like the face of lgbt movements and the lgbt history we learn is white first but like really we should be equally learning about like queer people of color and we should be learning about disabled queer people just as much because they exist they are a part of this world sometimes people think oh that's you know that's such a niche um like identity but like there are people out there in the world that have that identity and they deserve to be advocated for as equally as um, someone else with maybe an identity that would receive more privilege. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, get that in there. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Danny, I really appreciate you coming out and sharing about your experiences tonight. Thank you. Um, and helping inform our listeners um, about all manners, all things pride. Um, there are two announcements I'm going to make very quickly before we close uh, because we do have a couple of events coming up here in town. Mm -hmm. So uh, this week on Thursday, uh, no, not Thursday, Friday, June the 28th, um, over at The Bird um, is a movie called Before Stonewall. Um, they are suggesting a donation to Virginia Pride of $4, and let me open this event again, and I can tell you when it takes place. Uh, over at the Bird on Friday at 7.15. And then on Saturday, um, Carytown Pride Parade mm -hmm. starts at 1 o'clock behind Alternatives Boutique. Uh, the parade kickoff is at 1.30. Um, 2.30 begins the rally in the alley, and there will be a party from 3 to 11 o'clock at Alternatives. Um, both of those events were advertised heavily on Facebook. I will include those links in the live stream feed um, for anybody that wants further information about those events. Um, and since we are running a couple of minutes over, I'm just going to shorten up my thoughts. Um, again, thank you, Danny. Thank you for um, having me. Thank you to our callers this evening. Um, even for those of you who offered something that wasn't necessarily appreciated in the conversation, it did help expand the conversation. So thank you for your participation all the same. And I hope you continue to listen afterwards and maybe learn a couple of things. That would be even cooler. Yes. Yeah, maybe. So um, if Kevin and Mike and the rest of you are still out there, I hope that you got something useful out of tonight's show. Um, and the next thing that I want to share with you guys is uh, it's time to close the show. Um, keep listening because tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, Sarah West will be here on the Sarah West Love Show on Wednesday evening, her, that's Human Equal Rights with Leslie. On uh, Thursday, uh, Mary Barres will be here in the afternoon with the self-care activist. And on Friday at 7 o'clock, we will be rebroadcasting Critiques for the Culture. Uh, so that gives you an idea of some wonderful things that you can listen to on The Work FM this week. Again, uh, if you uh, appreciate and value uh, what we bring you from The Work FM, then we would appreciate seeing how much you value us 
in dollars. Uh, so don't be afraid to hit that donate button. Um, I almost feel bad, but I've heard such blatant begs on other radio stations that I kind of don't. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> so I'm trying to get past that part where I thought I felt bad about it. Uh, but it is time to close. So I'm going to talk to you guys again next week. Um, it'll be building up because um, we're getting terribly close to that next big holiday, you know, the one, July the 4th. Uh, so next week we'll be talking um, – about all things American. And uh, mm. until then, I'm going to leave you uh, with, well, the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in to In the Frequency of Hope. My name is Stephanie. I will talk to you next week on um, Monday, July the 1st. Good night. Do you want to say good night? Uh, bye and happy Pride. From KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is Rising Up with Sonali, and I'm your host, Sonali Kohatkar. We're online at risingupwithsonali.com. On our show today, we'll speak with R. Lawrence Moore, Professor Emeritus of History and American Studies at Cornell University, to discuss his book, Godless Citizens in a Godly Republic, Atheists in American Public Life. Then, one of the nation's leading Marxist economists, Richard Wolff, on his new book, Understanding Marxism. Dr. Wolff will join us for an in-depth discussion of the book and of the renewed interest in Marx's work and in socialism. That's coming up in just a moment. From KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Rising Up with Sonali, and I'm your host, Sonali Kolhatkar. You can watch this program on Free Speech TV and listen to it on Pacifica Radio stations and affiliates nationwide. The United States is a deeply religious country. A poll in 2016 by the Public Religion Research Institute found that nearly 70% of Americans identify as Christian, and about 45% say they attend church regularly. Of the rest, of course, there are myriad at other religions, including Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, etc. There are constitutional protections for religious beliefs. And in fact, the idea of religious liberty has been deeply politicized by Donald Trump's government and the American evangelical right wing. But what about the non-believers among us? Why in a nation that also separates church from state is there such an outsized representation of religion and protections of religious liberties? A new history book attempts to explore this question. Its co-author R. Lawrence Moore now joins me. He's a professor emeritus of History and American Studies at Cornell University, and his co-author is Isaac Kramnik. The name of the book is Godless Citizens in a Godly Republic, Atheists in American Public Life. Welcome to the program, Larry. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, of course, the, the history of the United States is uh, very, very critical to this question of why there are so many protections for Christians and Christianity and religion and religious people in general, and so few for atheists, right? Uh, this was basically a country founded um, by people who were escaping religious persecution. Is that, uh, in a nutshell, why we have such a deeply religious country today that protects religious views so much? Or is it a lot more complicated than that? Well, you know it's more complicated than that. But <laughs> That's why you wrote a book about it. Yeah, and it, it's, of course, not just history. I mean, 
I want to say one thing right out that, you know, I taught American religious history for 40 years and wrote about it. And there is nothing in this book that is meant to be hostile to religion. It is simply a sort of bringing up to date the concept.